I didn't realize that it didn't start. It, it's in, so I'm like, oh good, I hit record, everything's fine. And then someone texted me and said, you know, it's not recording. And oh. so the, it said the host had to approve the recording. So really? even I, yeah, even though I set up the room, um, because she because went she joined first. Yeah, yeah. So just kind of heads up if that ever happens. Oh, good to know. Good you to you know. probably got us something on your screen to uh, for an approval. To I did. I clicked it. Okay. okay. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay. So guys, we're just getting going. If anybody wants to unmute and say hello, I'll say hi to Laura Weber. So Laura is one of the reasons that we're meeting at ten. Uh, because when I was setting up webinars and it was getting to be nice weather, Laura's like, could you maybe ha have some morning webinars so that then we can all be outside uh, <laughs> playing in our yeah. gardens in the field in the afternoon. So thanks, Laura. That's why we're here at 10. Hello, Denise, everyone. Hello, I see Bev waving. Hello. Hey, Tuck. Some of you are doing the bee survey. Did you get your bowls out this week? I didn't yet. Jim, good morning. Yes, I did, by the way. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, my, my bowls are out even as we speak. Uh -huh. So I have to collect them this afternoon. I haven't been able to get mine out. I wish it would stop having such a high chance of rain. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm hoping to do <laughs> I'm going to try after this webinar to get them out. We'll see. I'm looking at 50% chance. I'm going to look at it again closer and go from there. Yeah, me too. I'm getting Hi, Nikki, How are you? Flies. <laughs> I got good news yesterday. Oh, share it. Um, my doctor, who told me back in march the spots in my lungs are growing said somebody has screwed up she thinks on reading the scans because when she compared numbers they're basically the same size so i'm not looking at chemo this month yeah. but yeah, I, since march, i've been thinking was going to oh. happen so i signed up for another study group <laughs> <laughs> I, I held off because I chemo wiped me out last time. But, oh, yeah. um, I was thrilled. So um, I'm riding on cloud nine right now. That's awesome. Good oh, very good news. And looking forward to getting out to the campus and seeing what's going on out there at our pollinator garden. Yeah, so Vicki and Marnie and I worked together on the, um, the, the Monarch um, right-of-way planting at uh, the Mansfield campus. And I haven't been there since last fall. Marnie, oh, have you the yeah. poor planting. It's, <laughs> I, and I haven't, John's been out either. So yeah, we had good plans for the, the goldenrod this year, but well, yeah, it'll, they'll still be there. <laughs> Well, let's see. It looks like it's 10 o'clock. So um, let's go ahead and get started. If you were um, saying hello and chatting, thanks for doing that. Go ahead and mute yourself. And uh, nice to have everybody here. I'm so excited to have Marnie Tichnell with us, who some of you have heard in the past. She does a lot of training as a um, program director for wildlife across the state. And um, this morning is going to talk about um, her love, which is wildlife, and her other love, which is bees and pollinators, and how the two really go hand in hand. So uh, we have our recording starting and um, I'm going to mute. Marnie, thanks so much for, for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so here's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, so, you know, we all know that bees are top pollinators, but our butterflies and our moths um, play their important role of insect pollinators. And then, of course, our hummingbirds are pollinators as well, as we all know. Um, these are also two groups of wildlife that we love seeing in our backyards and in our landscapes and on our properties. So along with their ecology today, I do want to talk a little bit on um, bringing them in to our properties. And then as Denise said, I'm also going to at the end kind of um, talk about how, you know, 
putting out plants and doing some other things in your backyard for, for these two groups of wildlife can be very um, beneficial and not just in your backyard, but on, I guess we could say on larger properties as well. Um, but, you know, really marrying that idea that um, when you're providing for pollinators, you're providing for a whole host of other uh, wildlife species. So the link that you are looking at right there, um, I, I recently started, uh, finally, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, I started my own little kind of blog. Um, and what I've mostly been using it for, which works out nicely, is when I do a webinar, I kind of, um, I'm, I post a blog and I, I put all my resources there. So you can go to this link, you'll come across an article, and then you'll see links to all of the um, citizen science projects that I'll mention in this presentation, plant lists, um, and I mean, you'll see as we go through. So a really nice, easy place for you to access all this material. So you shouldn't have to worry about jotting anything down except this one that you're looking at right here, and it'll pop up a few more times as we go along here today. So we're going to start by uh, talking about the bird side, and we'll, we'll work, we'll, we will work our way into hummingbirds. Um, but, you know, pollination by birds, this is um, definitely not so much here in Ohio, with the exception of the hummingbird, but this is definitely important as we look across the world. So we see about 2,000 different bird species that are our pollinators. And when we get into the tropical areas, they serve as, as very important pollinators, some of which are just as important as uh, the insects. So the Malachite sunbird you're looking at on the right there is a great example of that and just, of course, a beautiful looking bird uh, as well. Um, and then, of course, we have our hummingbirds. And so we're looking right now at a couple species that we do not have here uh, in Ohio. These are, again, more tropical species, but I just wanted to pop up a couple of pictures of, of just how beautiful um, these hummingbirds are. And, and we know our, our ruby throated hummingbird is not sh too shabby uh, itself. But, you know, as you as you look across um, the United States and into tropical areas, these are really, um, as the name of the one of them, little gems um, out there on the landscape. So there's uh, about 300 species in the world. We have about 17 here in the United States, uh, though most of them um, are right around that Mexican or uh, Mexico border where, you know, the, the climate is uh, warmer and plant diversity is a bit higher. Now, our hummingbirds have, of course, special adaptations for obtaining nectar. Um, and it really, it goes, it's, it's all about the bill and the tongue. And so I want to spend a few uh, minutes talking about that because I, I find it really interesting. <laughs> So let's start by looking at the tongue. This picture that you're looking at is a, um, a, a very high quality and uh, very close up view of the tip of the tongue of a hummingbird. And so if you didn't know this already, it is split at the tip. And the, whole, the tongue is almost, it's full of these kind of little tiny micro pumps. Um, so that middle bullet, it's talking about how the fluid at the tip of that tongue is kind of driven into the tongue's grooves from a re-expansion of the collapsed section of the tongue. Let me put that into simpler terms. Um, I think of it as, you know, you have your, your sponge that you wash your dishes with, you stick it in the water, you squeeze all the water out, and then as you allow that sponge to kind of re-expand underwater, it soaks that water in. And that's kind of what the tip, that's pretty much essentially what the tip of these hummingbird tongues are doing, which is what makes them so um, efficient at um, sucking in that nectar. Sorry, I had to step away a minute there because uh, my computer uh, wasn't plugged in. I had to click the light, <laughs> light switch. Didn't want to die in the middle of this. So um, it's soaking in that nectar, and then the tongue, of course, itself is very flexible to bring that nectar right back into, um, into the mouth. And if you've watched videos of hummingbirds uh, drink nectar, it's very, very fast. And this tongue is moving very, very fast, of five to 10 drops of nectar every 100th of a second. It's pretty amazing when you stop and really think about it. Now, it's not just the tongue, it's the bill as well that um, makes them even more efficient at obtaining this nectar quickly and, uh, and easily. And we know, we know the bill, we're familiar with that bill, that long curved uh, bill that can fit perfectly into flowers that are, are specially adapted uh, to be pollinated by birds. So usually they have a very long, uh, they're longer shaped flowers and that, that nectar is deep at the base of it. 
So this is the ruby-throated hummingbird that you're looking at there. So the bills are, despite they look very sharp, they're, they're quite flexible. Um, and they do have soft kind of concave tips. And that works to kind of squeeze that nectar out of the tongue. Once, once it has um, soaked up that nectar, uh, the tongue kind of, or the, the bill kind of fits back over that tongue and it just really squeezes it out and all of that nectar, you know, goes into the belly. Now I do want to share uh, in other parts of, of the world, especially going back to those more tropical areas, where um, there is a higher plant diversity, there are more species of hummingbirds, and so competition over resources can be uh, a little bit more fierce. And maybe some of you are already familiar with our ruby-throated hummingbird and how um, they're, they're feisty. You know, they, they can definitely be territorial, and maybe you've even witnessed some hummingbird squabbles. So it's kind of in their nature, despite their teeny tiny size, to be fierce. And in the tropics, they're um, even more equipped to be fierce. And so that picture you're looking at is the bill of a tropical hummingbird species. And they're often equipped with, um, you know, hooked like you're seeing at the tips. And um, those aren't teeth, but they look like teeth. It's just sharp edges, serrated edges um, of the bill. And so that's to help them, uh, you know, compete for those resources. So don't mess with the tropical hummingbirds. <laughs> So that brings us to our Ohio ruby-throated hummingbird. I call them our mini marathoners because they are uh, flying thousands of miles on wing power alone every year. Uh, we tend to see them here in Ohio, roughly April, and then they'll stay um, October, November, typically sometimes a little bit later. Um, this is the time of my presentations where I tell you, if you don't know already, you never have to take your hummingbird feeders down for fear of uh, hummingbirds not migrating. They will migrate when their bellies are full and when they know they have enough energy to, to make that trip. So always leave your hummingbird feeders out until the hummingbirds disappear. Hopefully this plays for you, uh, and if it doesn't, uh, Denise, let me know. But I'm just gonna click this. This is a really nice, abundance map that was uh, created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, through their citizen science project called eBird. So maybe some of you already participate in eBird, but it's essentially just going out and looking for birds and then um, recording the birds that you saw in a given area, I mean, much like you're doing with bees uh, and everything with Denise. Um, and this has been an incredibly successful project so much so that they have been able to take all of the data they have received and um, really answer some, some interesting questions and create these beautiful abundance maps. And so for the, the hummingbird, you're just kind of watching that, um, that migratory journey as they travel up north. <clears throat> and the darker the color, the more uh, hummingbirds there are in the area. And then as they travel back down towards the end of the year. So you can go to ebird.org and then click on the science tab and you can see these abundance maps for a lot of our, our species in the United States. So great teaching tools, but just really cool to just look at and, uh, and watch. So just in case you're not completely comfortable identifying our ruby-throated hummingbird, um, I kind of just gave it away there, but this throws people. So you're looking at that little hummingbird here, and this is actually is the ruby-throated ruby hummingbird, but you're noticing that dark patch, and uh, you might think it's something else because you're not seeing that, that ruby throat color. Well, here is a picture, again, of a ruby-throated hummingbird, and you see how some of that throat patch is uh, that ruby red color. Well, it depends on where the sun is hitting that bird. And this goes for a lot of our birds. They have these reflective feathers that sometimes the colors do not show up unless the sunlight is, is hitting those feathers. Um, so hummingbirds, male hummingbirds, which you're looking at right here, that have that ruby red throat patch um, on a cloudy day or a very shady spot, you may not see that red. Um, it's not a different species. It's just uh, not in the sun sunshine. So here's the female. So females, they have that nice emerald green back, but then their neck and their chest is kind of white and there might be some light gray uh, kind of modeling as you can see there on that picture. So the ruby-throated hummingbird um, right here, this is the only species that we have breeding here in Ohio. 
but we do have a few other occasional visitors. So a few years ago, uh, in, right here in Delaware County where I live, there was a calliope hummingbird, uh, a male that stuck around all the way through, I think, mid-December. Um, so that, that was quite um, a buzz on the birding uh, um, email listservs because it doesn't happen very often. We don't see a calliope hummingbird here very often. You can see on that picture on the right, their range is way out west. So that little guy definitely was off course quite a bit as he journeyed down south, but it does happen. Um, it also happens with the rufous hummingbird. And so this is also a Western species, but more often we will have the rufous hummingbird um, here in the east. Uh, and if you go to eBird that we just talked about, um, you can actually see where the rufous hummingbird has shown up. And there are quite a few sightings uh, over the past several years uh, here in Ohio and other states in the east. Um, so it's just on their migrational journey as they head down, uh, down south in the fall. Sometimes they will go off course and they'll end up over here. And you tend to see them if you have your, your um, a feeder outlet or if you have um, fall or late summer blooming um, vegetation um, flowers. So another reason to kind of um, have some of those late blooming flowers. So it's not the cold temperatures that cause hummingbirds to migrate. It really goes back to their food source. And, and that's really the case with uh, many of our migratory birds. Um, it's that, that food source or the competition over food uh, that causes them um, to, to migrate. And so here we have a little Anna's hummingbird, totally fine, even though it's you know, snow covered. Uh, so they have the capability to survive those cold temperatures. It's, it's really that, uh, that food that they, that they don't have when it gets cold. Because if you don't realize it, hummingbirds need insects as well as nectar. So obviously both of those food sources are hard to come by in the winter. We talked about the adaptations that hummingbirds have for obtaining nectar from a flower. Um, but if you didn't realize it, they also have adaptations for obtaining insects. And so they'll feed on spiders, flies, and, and other small um, insects. But they have a, a flexible lower jaw. And I'm going to pop up some, some pictures. These are pictures taken from some research done in 2004. And um, you can kind of see that lower bill or that lower mandible, uh, especially in that last picture, is really flexed downward. Now, this is unusual when it comes to birds. Um, for m many of our birds, and as well as other uh, tetrapods, our lower jaw is flexible where it meets the skull. It's not really flexible at any other part of that jaw, but in hummingbirds, the distal half, um, that bottom half of the lower um, mandible is flexible. And with hummingbirds, you can see in that last picture, it really is advantageous that they can open that jaw up as wide as possible, um, especially since it's so long and narrow uh, to get those insects. Um, and so, scientifically shown <laughs> with this research that that in, in that extra flexibility really helps them uh, to capture those insects. Okay, so let's move into a little bit about bringing hummingbirds into uh, a landscape. So they like a mix of sun and shade. Um, many of the plants that they're going to like to nectar on are going to, to do uh, best in full sun and that's I'm really referring to some of those native perennials. As far as nesting, that's where some of the shade comes in. They do like to, to nest in calmer, shadier, low traffic areas. Um, the nests are often hard to find because they are really well camouflaged, as you can see in that upper picture. Um, the female, she will build that nest with uh, small grass fibers stuck together with spider webs. And then she will cover it all with lichen, which really works to camouflage um, that nest. And if you're looking at it from below, it just looks like kind of a, a, a knot or a bump on that, on that branch. So I have another picture I just want to show you really quick. This was taken several years ago for, um, by Ashley Kulhanek, who is, who is our extension educator in Medina County. And uh, even though the nest is out of focus, you can definitely see that it's covered in lichen. And then she got a really cool picture. It was the best that she could from above. And there were two little eggs. Uh, and those eggs are about the size of uh, Jelly Belly um, jelly beans. So very, very tiny. So what to plant for hummingbirds? 
Well, um, the, the color and the shape of the flower is definitely important. Um, so you're looking at the cardinal flower right there, and that's a great example, especially how it's, it's oriented in the landscape right here, of what hummingbirds are looking for. So those tubular uh, flower shapes, perfectly designed for that bill to sneak right in there to get the, the, the nectar. Uh, the, the blooms or the flowers are horizontally positioned, so it's very easy for a hovering hummingbird to access it. And that plant is kind of, it's not crowded in by other plants. Um, so there's plenty of room for them to hover. So you always have to keep that in mind with your hummingbirds. Um, they prefer to hover while they drink. Um, so uh, you don't wanna not give them that room and that space. Now hummingbirds are attracted to orange and in particularly scarlet because we all know that they're, hum or that they're uh, big Buckeye fans. Um, in truth, they really are attracted to these two colors. And so uh, always having those colors in your landscape is a good idea to bring them in. Once your hummingbirds are comfortable in your yard and they're, um, they're visiting frequently, you will see them visiting other flowers uh, as well. So they visit many flowers. So here's a list. Again, I will have these lists uh, on that um, blog article, uh, the link that I gave you earlier. So please don't feel that you need to jot these down hurriedly. You can access them later. So again, we're looking at the cardinal flower. Great example there. Um, Minarda or bee balm, that's another great example. And here's the great blue lobelia. Um, I have all three of these in my landscape and I've seen hummingbirds nectaring on all of them. So all great, um, great plants to have out there as well as the others on this, on the, on this list. I just thought I'd pop this one up. This is jewelweed. I don't know if any of you have this in your landscape. I don't think it's a real common one that we purposely put in our backyards. Um, I see it very frequently uh, and naturally as an understory um, forb in wet shady woodlands, um, also called touch me not. But it is a plant that is um, primarily po pollinated by hummingbirds and insects. So um, there's definitely a, a cool relationship here. So if you have a, a wet um, shady spot, it might be something that you think about incorporating. Um, though I'm not sure how, how the spread is. It might, it might be a pretty aggressive spreader, but I'm not sure about that. Always look up your plants to make sure you're putting it in the right place. And then I just put a picture of milkweed in here. I do have butterfly weed on the, on the list because of course that's our bright orange uh, milkweed. I have yet to see a hummingbird nectaring on my milkweed. Um, go ahead and put in the chat if you have um, seen hummingbirds uh, nectaring on your milkweed. It'd be interesting to learn that because I always see it on the list. I just myself haven't seen it. And then of course, here's a list of woody plants. We never want to leave off the woody plants uh, when we're talking about putting out plants for uh, pollinators. And that definitely goes for our hummingbirds and our butterflies. And you'll see that later when we get into butterflies. But just a few shrubs and low growing trees listed here. Um, those are the native azaleas I have right there. Uh, and then the picture you're looking at is of, of course the Eastern redbud. Service berry is a, another great one for hummingbirds. It's also great for songbirds. It's, it's my number one uh, tree to put out there for songbirds because the blooms come on early and so do the berries, um, which is nice for, uh, for our birds. This is the native honeysuckle vine. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that there are non-native invasive um, bush honeysuckles, so they grow in more of a shrub or bush form. Um, some of them also do kind of have a vine-like tendency. So definitely be careful with this one and make sure you are definitely getting the Lanisra sempervirens, which is the native one. Um, that said, this is in my yard and you do have to cut it back every year because it is, it is definitely a happy grower and it, it can get rather bushy as I found this year because I was lax in, in trimming it back the few couple of years. So I had to spend a good, a good amount of time uh, beating it back this year. But it's beautiful and it has these, these lovely orange red uh, flowers that the hummingbirds definitely like. Um, it's sometimes called trumpet honeysuckle because it does resemble the trumpet creeper, which is another vine that is of course very heavily visited by hummingbirds. However, that is definitely an aggressive spreader, so you want to be careful if you choose to put that uh, in your landscape. And then as far as, oh, I forgot I have these pictures in here. So uh, this is again my honeysuckle vine, and I actually had a cardinal build a nest uh, within it that tells you how shrubby and bushy I let it get. But it was kind of neat because I had uh, a single cardinal uh, fledge um, from this little spot in the side of my house, which I've never had before, which was neat.
Now, as far as trees, uh, I have just a few examples here. The one you're looking at is the yellow poplar or the tulip poplar, which is a great, once you're, the tree is big enough and producing flowers like this, it is a great source of nectar. Um, red buckeyes are also wonderful, as, as well as black cherry. Now, these lists, of course, are not all inclusive. I know you all can add several other species to these lists that are also great for hummingbirds as well. So I wanna finish up with hummingbirds by talking a little bit on feeders because that's something we, we also like to do and it's something that's great for, um, for our hummingbirds. It's always great to get natural food sources out there first in the landscape, but then you know, have your feeders as kind of a supplemental food source. So um, one fourth a cup of sugar and one cup of water. Um, so that's the ratio you're looking at. You can up that sugar a little bit if you have some hummingbirds um, sticking late into the fall or showing up during the winter and that's just to give them a little bit more energy, a little bit more fuel to help them complete their journeys. You do not need to color the water, the sugar water. That's not, not necessary to do. Just get one of the red feeders like you, you see here and that color will serve to bring them in. Um, it's recommended to use table sugar over honey because honey you can a slightly higher chance of it um, getting bacteria in it a little bit quicker. And you're already having to clean, or you should be cleaning your hummingbird feeders every few days, um, sometimes more frequently if it's really hot out. So you don't wanna do anything that's going to um, make you have to clean them more often than you already are. Um, you can, if you're just going to um, put the water out really quickly, you, you don't really necessarily have to boil it. But what I do is I'll make a big batch and I'll boil it and stick it in the fridge so it lasts longer. Um, and then I'll refill it uh, throughout the week. And so then replacing it every two to three days during the summer, sometimes daily in very hot weather. So what style of feeder is best? There's lots of different styles. The ones that I've been showing you on these past couple are the ones that I like the best. And it's simply because they're easiest to clean. Again, you're going to have to be cleaning these frequently, so get the ones that are less pieces and parts and you don't need special brushes and everything to clean. So this is a dish feeder and um, it's again easy to clean. It has nice little perches uh, and you can actually put a decent amount. It holds a decent amount of, um, of sugar as well. So put it in a, a secure area. Naturally, if you can put it in an area where you can see it, that is obviously what we want to do. We want to be able to enjoy them. Um, and then remember what I said earlier about our hummingbirds being fierce and sometimes territorial. So if you can uh, put out several feeders um, kind of spaced around your yard, that's going to be best for the hummingbirds. Whereas if you have just one feeder and you have a lot of hummingbirds, you may ultimately, especially this time of year when they're nesting, you may, you may see one male uh, chasing off all the other ones. And then again, plants are better and have these feeders as kind of a supplemental food source. So around this time of year, I sometimes get questions from folks, you know, I've seen a lot of hummingbirds in my yard, but all of a sudden they're just gone. Where do they go? Well, there's several different reasons. The biggest one is it is nesting season. Isn't that an amazing uh, picture um, from Vassar College? I just, I love it. Um, so nesting season. So we have uh, territorial males at this time. So they may be chasing away other hummingbirds from your yard if, if their territory is your yard. The females are now spending more time on their eggs. And they're also hunting for insects because they need that protein and their nestlings need that protein. So they may be spending less time at your flower and your feeder. And then there also may be natural food sources available. Uh, remember that tulip poplar that I, I showed you, that bloom that I showed you just a few minutes ago. Um, if you, you know, live near a woodland and you have a lot of those poplars blooming, they will definitely go to that source of nectar um, over your feeder. So that might be another, another reason why they temporarily disappear. They'll be back though, don't worry. other things that you can do. Water features are always popular for all of our birds, um, but tripping or misters are good for hummingbirds. Um, and of course, native plants uh, that are pollinated by insects. So you're providing that insect uh, food source as well. Nature goes round and round, right? Um, lessen or eliminate the use of pesticides. I know you guys know that. Um, group similar plants together. So a lot, uh, you know, much like what we talk about with our insect pollinators, group those plants together so they can see them and stop and visit. Continuous blooms throughout the year. 
Um, and then shrubbery and small trees kind of along the edges of your yard, if you can place them near nectar sources, that's great. That's really going to encourage those females um, to possibly nest in those small trees right next to that food source. I'll just pop this up really quick. And again, I'll have this link in my blog article, but this is a, um, a citizen science project specifically, specifically for hummingbirds. Um, and this is uh, Audubon. And what they're trying to collect is just information on uh, where and when hummingbirds are seen nectaring at, and at, at what plants. So you all, you have fantastic knowledge on plants and, and pollinators. I know this would be, um, you'd be really great at this if you're interested in it. Um, the kind of the basis uh, for, for this project is um, as we are seeing plant distributions and, and things shifting due to climate change, there's a question on how this is going to impact um, our hummingbirds that are also dependent on those plants. And so uh, what better way to kind of start answering those questions than to gather some information on um, when and on what hummingbirds are nectaring on. So um, consider um, joining that if you wanna help out with that data collection. This is a really nice site, again, by Audubon. It's a native plant database, great information with native plants. But what I like about it is you can uh, put it in a native plant or search from a native plant and they'll, they'll pop up all of the birds that will use this plant, whether it's for nectar or for seed later on. And that, so I think that's kind of a neat, a neat feature on the wildlife side. And again, I'll have that on my blog article. Now, I don't know how many of you have experienced this before. Um, sugar, sugar water is definitely a tasty treat, not just for the hummingbirds. Um, so just, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you find your hummingbird feeder on the ground, uh, it, it's likely a raccoon got into it overnight. Um, so just think about where you're placing that, uh, that feeder um, on a shepherd's hook is kind of nice because that, that means it makes it a little bit harder for squirrels and other critters to reach it. Um, if they're still reaching it at night, maybe bring it in at night. Um, and just remember, of course, some of you are in Northeast Ohio, so it could be worse. <laughs> um, hopefully you haven't experienced this, and this is not a picture from Ohio. And just for fun, in other parts of uh, the United States, especially the um, western, southern parts, they have other visitors to their hummingbird feeders. How cool would this be if at night you had a bat visiting your hummingbird feeder? Well, unfortunately, here in Ohio, that will not happen because all of our bats here in Ohio are insect eaters. Um, but in other parts of the world, they have bats visiting as well. All right, so let's take a minute, enjoy these uh, comic, a little comics as we switch our brains from hummingbirds and move into butterflies. All right, Lepidopterans. So Lepidoptera, that is the order um, of which, uh, to which our butterflies, our skippers, and our moths belong to. And maybe I'm sure some of you can already identify this species. This is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. So some characteristics of our Lepidopterans, um, scales, or scale-covered wings and bodies. In fact, lep uh, Lepido means scale and Terra means wings, named for this characteristic. They do have complete metamorphosis, which means they have those four distinct stages, egg, larva, uh, pupa, or in the case of butterflies, chrysalis, and then the adult. Um, that's contrasted with incomplete metamorphosis when you have the egg, the um, uh, nymph, and the adult. So we see those four distinct uh, stages within our lepidopterans. And then we have the uh, proboscis. So this is the tool that uh, lepidopterans use to obtain nectar. And just like we talked about with hummingbirds, how uh, their bill and their tongue is very specialized to obtain that nectar, the same can be said for our lepidopterans and for the uh, proboscis. So if you've never delved into um, the science uh, of the proboscis, I encourage you to because it's, it's fascinating. Um, do a little search into the science and try to find some high quality pictures. They're out there. But it's quite amazing because um, this is, is one of nature's most complex creations. If you're teaching kids, we often say, oh, it's just a straw and it sucks up the nectar. And that is, that's an accurate way to describe it, but it's very simplified. So it's not just a tube, it's self-cleaning. It is laden with pores and sensors and internal muscles as well as, as, well as other tissues that each have their own job. Um, and depending on the species of Lepidopteran, that proboscis could be covered with shingles or spines or bumps. So they're very unique looking. 
Um, so it's, it's quite fascinating. Now, as we look at um, the number of butterfly skippers and moths within this order, um, which is rather large, over 11,000 species in, in just North America, we see that the majority of them are moths. And that, that applies worldwide as well as North America, as well as Ohio. So here in Ohio, we have about 144 roughly butterflies and skippers, and then we have 3,000 plus moths. So we're still not sure exactly how many species of moths we have here in Ohio. And so I, I, I think oftentimes we focus on butterflies. I'm, I'm guilty of doing that with this presentation because butterflies, you know, they, they, we do see them more often during the day than moths, though we do have some diurnal moths. Um, and uh, they're often beautif beautifully colored, though as you can see on the right there, our cecropia moth is just as beautiful. Um, but we do tend to bring in the butterflies a little bit more than we do the moths. But I, I don't want to gloss over the moths and we'll kind of look at some other pictures as we go through here because they are just um, as important. Uh, they are key components of ecosystems, not just in um, their, the pollination services. Some of our moths are very important pollinators, um, but 75% of our breeding birds rely on moth caterpillars as prey. So they have uh, very critical roles in the ecosystems as a prey species as well. Now, some of you, I, you know, I know you're com comfortable with what butterflies are, you're comfortable with, with moths are, but maybe you're saying, well, what do you mean when, when you say skippers? What are these skippers that you speak of? Simplest terms, they're lepidopterans. <laughs> if you go back, uh, at one point, skippers were thought to be more closely related to butterflies, then they were thought to be more closely related to moths. Now the jury is out um, and it's safest just to say that they are lep lepidopterans and they fall somewhere in between. So they tend to be a, uh, a little bit smaller. Um, and as you can see from the, that picture, their bodies are a little bit more furrier or hairier, I should say, which uh, tends to lean us more towards the moth side. But then they have hooked antenna, which is more like the butterfly side. So again, somewhere in between. This is the silver spotted uh, skipper. It's nectaring off some clover, of some clover there, but I frequently see these silver spotted skippers all over my sedums um, every year in my yard. So keep your eye out and I, um, once you can identify them, you'll, you'll start to see some skippers. So what I wanna do next is um, go over some of the different butterfly families here in Ohio and I have them all listed out here and just very briefly touch on them, some of the representatives in each species and some of the, the, the cool um, little things about their ecology um, that, that I find interesting and hopefully you do too. So starting out with the Lycinidae, also known as the gossamer wings and some of the repre representatives of this family um, are the harvester uh, butterfly, which I'll pop up a picture of in just a minute. Um, the coppers, uh, the hair streaks, um, and some of the hair streaks, that would be your eastern tail blue, uh, and then your spring and summer azures. Um, another representative of this family is the coroner blue butterfly, which uh, maybe you're familiar with. That's our endangered, um, both state and federally endangered butterfly. And cool story with the coroner blue butterfly is that it was the first butterfly, endangered butterfly, to be reintroduced in the country. And that reintroduction happened right here in Ohio, um, up in the Kitty Todd Nature Conservancy Preserve, which um, is in Toledo, Ohio. And I'm actually from Toledo, Ohio. This introduction happened in 1998. And uh, my first kind of volunteer experience in the wildlife world was at Oak Openings Nature Preserve. And they had habitat there for the Carner Blue Butterfly. Uh, and I actually, um, one of the first things I did for volunteering was uh, surveying for lupin, which is the host plant of the Carner Blue butterfly. Um, so kind of an, a neat story there. And uh, now I am many, many years ago talking about them. Here's the harvester butterfly. I focus harvest butterfly. If you don't know, there's a neat thing about the ecology of this, of this species. And it's that its caterpillar is carnivorous. No, so they feed on um, adelgids, and that's the little little white fluffy guys at the bottom part of that picture that I um, that I just popped up. So maybe some of you are familiar with um, Joe Boggs. He is uh, another one of our extension educators and an entomologist, 
And he talks about the beach, uh, the woolly beach adelgid. Um, he also calls them the boogie woogie uh, aphids because if you see them all over a beach branch and you tap it, they all start boogie woogieing. They kind of shake a little bit. And they do that to kind of um, make them look like a bigger animal because they're often clustered together and hopefully they'll scare that, um, that predator away. Uh, there's other reasons why they boogie woogie as well. But um, I recently found out from Joe that those beach um, boogie woogie aphids are, are a little bit fierce and they will actually bite back um, at the, uh, the harvester um, caterpillar. They'll, they'll use their sucking mouthpieces to kind of poke him. So the harvester um, caterpillar doesn't mess so much uh, with the boogie woogie aphids, but they do feed on um, alder aphids. Um, so kind of a neat, again, a neat part of that ecology. The adults, um, they um, oftentimes are going to be eating the honeydew that comes from the aphids. Uh, they don't visit flowers too often. This is just a little picture of the eggs of the butterflies within this family, kind of an urchin shaped eggs. And then one other thing I'll mention about this family of butterflies that I find really interesting is they have this cool relationship with ants. So if you haven't heard of myrmecophily before, it essentially means ant love, okay? And so many of these gossamer wing butterflies have this mutualistic relationship with ants. So they are secreting these um, kind of sugary secretions, for lack of a better word, that have um, nutrients that the ants like to feed on. And they also get some, some carbs and some amino acids that they need as well uh, from those secretions. So that's kind of the benefit on the ant side. And then of course the caterpillar benefits because the ants are around that caterpillar and they protect it from other predators. It's kind of a neat relationship there between ants and our gossamer wing butterflies. So the um, Rio Dinidae are metal marks and we see two uh, species that we have here in Ohio. That one is the swamp metal mark. It is an endangered species here in Ohio. And that is the, the northern metal mark. So thanks to Jim McCormick for those uh, fantastic pictures. Um, but we tend to see um, both of these species are uh, unfortunately um, uncommon here in Ohio, but we do see them every so often. The northern metal mark we see in more dry open meadows, whereas the swamp, as the name would imply, we see in more wet habitats, wet meadows. Uh, both the adults we can see, um, they like to nectar on uh, black-eyed Susans like you see there in that bottom picture, but they'll visit multiple flowers as well. And then we have the brush foots, um, the uh, Nymphalidae, which you're probably familiar with. That's uh, what our monarch butterfly belongs to. And then we have the red admiral down there in that bottom picture. But also the commas, the emperors, the um, admirals, the wood satyrs, viceroy, mourning cloak, all of those butterflies belong to the brushfoot. This is a very diverse, very large family. And they get their name because their um, front legs have been reduced and modified into these brush-like structures. Um, don't ask me what they were for. I've, I've delved into the science. I talked to Joe Boggs about it and he doesn't know either and that's simply because the science isn't there. We don't really know why they have these brush light structures. Um, one of the theories is that maybe it's, it aids in sensory, uh, additional sensory ability, but again, that has not been fully proven. Oh, the monarch and a red admiral there. And then we have our swallowtails. This is probably a, a very easily recognized and identified group of, of butterflies due to their bright colors. Um, they tend to be more medium to large size. Here again, we have our eastern tiger swallowtail butterflies. And we'll look at some more swallowtails a little bit later. Oh, right now, sorry. Um, so interesting story about the eastern tiger swallowtail up in, let's see, central and northern Ohio, you tend to see males and females that are yellow in color, like that first picture I popped up. But as you go down further south, you're going to see females um, black in color, like that bottom picture that you see right there. And the reason is because the females are mimicking another swallowtail that is distasteful in flavor, much like the monarch butterfly uh, caterpillar and butterfly is distasteful. And so they're mimicking the pipe vine swallowtail um, seen here in these pictures. The pipe vine swallowtail or the host plants is the um, pipe vine, also known as the Virginia snake root. 
which isn't incredibly common here in Ohio. It is native, but we see it again in the southern parts um, of the state, which is where we see our pipe vine swallowtail. And that is also why the females of the eastern tiger swallowtail mimic that pipe vine. And there are other swallowtails um, uh, and other butterflies that mimic the pipe vine as well. So the black swallowtail, the spice bush swallowtail, and the red spotted purple. And they all kind of have that dark coloration with those lighter spots at the base uh, of the, um, their hind wings. Last but not least, we have our sulfurs and our whites, very common butterflies. We tend to see these butterflies in disturbed habitats. We definitely see them within our neighborhoods and our backyards. Um, the cabbage white uh, is probably um, one of the, the few butterflies that has become a nuisance. Um, and it was introduced from uh, Europe accidentally. Um, so that's our uh, paridid. So that was a little bit on our butterfly families. Um, again, I pop this up just reminding you that they have this complete metamorphosis, but specifically so we realize that the different stages of these Lepidopteran have different needs. So the caterpillars of, uh, or the, the adults, um, of course, are looking for nectar, though we, uh, we do have butterflies that will feed on other things like sap, um, uh, decaying or rotting fruit. Some butterflies will even visit uh, carrion, uh, decaying fungi and um, feces. And then of course, the adult uh, females are very specific in the plants that they lay their eggs on. And when those eggs hatch, the caterpillars are right there on the plant that they need to survive. And so they are eating machines, so your host plants, um, the, uh, the plants that the females lay their eggs on, they will get eaten. Always something important to keep in mind. Okay. Some general rules of thumb for our Lepidopteran plants, um, daisy-like flower shapes, spikes of multiple flowers and flat round, round top clusters are great. The idea between all of those is when that, that Lepidopteran stops to grab a bite to eat, there is a lot of food um, for that stop. Um, so a lot of bang for their buck, you could say. They're going to visit multiple flowers and multiple colors, so there aren't any specific colors that our Lepidopterans are attracted to. Aim for continuous blooms throughout the growing season, like we always talk about with our pollinators. And here's just a list of um, some of those plants that are great for our, our, um, our Lepidopterans, and you're going to recognize a lot of those. They're great for all of our pollinators. And I've just kind of, kind of put them in bloom time. And again, this, this table will be available on that blog article. As we talked about with hummingbirds, let's not forget our woody plants. We often think about flower, sunlit uh, blooms um, with our butterflies, but uh, our, our woodlands are very important resources for our pollinators as well, uh, and our butterflies, our lepidopterans. So there are lots of nectar sources when we look across our woody and uh, our woody species. And so there's just a list right there and you'll recognize some of those. We already talked about them for hummingbirds. And there, once again, is our tulip, tulip poplar. You're probably familiar with the Ohio Trees for Bees fact sheet that Denise Ellsworth uh, wrote. I love this fact sheet. It's great, of course, for um, pollen and nectar sources for bees, but it's also a good list to go to for our Lepidopterans as well. And just keep in mind our woodlands, not just for host plants and for nectar, um, but also for shelter as well. So you're looking at the morning cloak, and this is one of our butterfly species here in Ohio that, that we first see in the springtime. It's one of the first that emerges, and that's because it does overwinter as an adult, and it'll overwinter oftentimes within our woodlands, underneath downed logs or within cavities uh, and trees. So I want to talk a little bit about host plants and give you some quick examples. So time for some butterfly ID. I know you guys know who this is. This is the monarch butterfly. But do you know which is male and which is female? Do, 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 do. So this is the female and this is the male. Easy way to tell is to look for those little, two little pheromone dots on the hind wings of the male. And then of course we have our viceroy, which is the uh, lookalike for the monarch, or you could say the monarch is the lookalike for the viceroy, however you wanna say it. Um, but here we go. So the viceroy is a malarian mimic of the monarch butterfly. So viceroys are distasteful as well. 
Um, we know that monarchs are, so are viceroys. And so by the, the fact that they are, are both distasteful, they both look similar, they're helping each other out. Okay, so that's kind of the idea be, between malaria and mimicry. Oh, I'll just go back. Our host plants for the viceroy are willows, poplars, and aspens, so definitely using those woody species. And we know that our monarch is looking for our milkweeds. One thing I like to uh, remind folks about milkweeds is that, um, you know, we think about the common, we think about the swamp, but there's lots of other species of milkweeds that are native to Ohio. Um, so if you can incorporate some of these other species, that's great. Though I, I will say the monarch does tend to prefer the common and the swamp uh, as far as laying, her, laying the eggs, but they'll use the other ones as well. If anybody knows what this one is that we're looking at, this is the great spangled fritillary and violet is the host plant for this butterfly. So all, all species of violets are used by this scary looking caterpillar. Uh, nothing will happen if you touch that caterpillar. It's just kind of bluffing, but there are some caterpillars that uh, you will have a negative reaction if you, if you touch those spines, any little burning or poking, stinging sensation. So never touch a caterpillar if you don't know what it is. Here's a very common butterfly, especially if you are a gardener and maybe you have some carrots or parsnips or, or dill or parsley. This is the black swallowtail. So they like to you, um, lay their eggs on members of the carrot family. I find that this caterpillar is often confused with the monarch just because of that black and kind of yellow orange coloration. So just something to be aware of as you talk to the general public, sometimes they get confused. And I'll just share with you, if it works, a cool little video of one of the, the defense mechanisms of the, um, the swallowtail. So of course it, it does derive some benefits uh, as some birds may mistake it as a monarch caterpillar. But if that doesn't work, it has these osmatera, which pop out of its head, well, base of its head and, uh, and body, and will emit a foul smelling gas. And you can smell it, especially if you've bumped them like you see there in that, in that video. Um, and it is definitely foul smelling. So kind of a neat, a neat thing to, um, to play with, but not too much. We don't wanna harass our caterpillars too much. Just a few woodland butterflies. This is our spring azure, beautiful little blue butterfly. Um, and it will use dogwood as a host plant as well as viburnum. And uh, it's on a dogwood right there. Tiny little caterpillars, very, um, very difficult to see, little green guys. And you often see these little blue um, azures uh, puddling um, on wet, wet soil, uh, trying to get some of the nutrients uh, within that soil. And then the summer azure host plants are sumac and holly. So kind of sticking with that theme of the importance of woody plants, this is some research from Doug Talmy, where he looked at uh, the different genuses of some of our, our, our trees and, the, and he discovered just a phenomenal number of species of Lepidopterans that are supported. So when I recommend woody plants for the landscape, I kind of direct folks, hey, look at this list. This is a great list to kind of go from. And at the top, of course, we saw our oaks and I didn't want to leave our moths out. Um, that's actually a butterfly or banded hair streak. That is a butterfly that will use oaks as a host plant. But then our, our polyphemus, our cercopia, and our luna moth. Um, a lot of times our moths use, they have a little bit more uh, plants that, a longer list of host plants than, than some of our butterflies. Um, but all of these species will use oaks um, as well. And they're all very beautiful, as you can see. For a more extensive list and for more information on uh, host plants, this is a publication from the Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. They uh, revamped it recently. Um, I helped contribute it. Denise definitely did. She actually has a shout out in the acknowledgments, which is really cool. But it's a very nice and beautiful publication and I will have it posted on my blog article because unfortunately, if you don't know already, the Division of Natural Resources, their website is down. So all of those beautiful Division of Wildlife field guides um, are not up and available. I do have them all though. So if you, if you need them, let me know and I can send you a PDF. So I just wanna finish up with the few minutes that I have left, uh, kind of looking at um, how when we manage for pollinators, we are creating these habitats that are invaluable for a great diversity of um, wildlife species, not just our, uh, the ones that we think of as pollinators. 
And so just some examples here, you know, if you're working on incorporating some um, native perennials and native warm season grasses into your property or into properties that you may uh, work on or oversee, um, this is also going to be great for our songbirds. They are going to find a diversity of insects and seeds and, and nesting sites um, within these um, prairies that you're creating. So I just popped up a picture of the eastern bluebird. This is a cavity nester, uh, so they're going to use naturally forming cavities in trees or nest boxes, but those types of cavities nearby or next to um, these uh, prairies are, are excellent places because this is where they're looking for their food. Um, they are primarily uh, insectivores during the growing season, but they'll also incorporate some berries uh, later on in the year. When we talk about our game birds, like our wild turkey and pheasant, uh, bobwhite quail, um, the, these types of habitats, our pollinator habitats with forbs, are, are really great for these birds, um, especially if you can incorporate some of those native warm season grasses or the bunch grasses. And the reason why those are really nice for nesting habitat is because the game birds will kind of crawl into the central, center of those bunch grasses and um, our blue stems especially will kind of hollow out in the middle of that bunch and they'll lay their eggs right in the middle and it just is this perfect protective cover uh, for, um, for those ground nests. And so in fact, the Xerces Society does um, recommend that your pollinator seed mix include some bunch grasses and, and that's because they're also used as nesting sites for bumblebees, uh, bumblebees but great for um, our game birds as well. And then these habitats are also used to raise their young or as brood rearing habitats. And there's a little picture of a, a pheasant, a little pheasant young down there, cute little fluff ball. Um, but 80% of the diet of a lot of our game birds are insects. And so of course, with the diversity of plants comes a diversity of insects. The one thing that's really important to keep in mind, if you are trying to have uh, these pollinator habitats uh, attractive to game birds is you do need some bare ground uh, within these these um, these plantings because as you see that little baby pheasant it's not very tall so if those plantings get really thick and have a, a, a thatch layer build up they're not going to be used by those game birds so habitats for um, our game birds and pollinators do need to be managed to kind of reduce that vegetation and keep some of that bare ground. Um, hedgerows um, bee buffers, right-of-ways, field borders, these are all great habitats for our pollinators as well as the game birds that we just talked about and, um, and our songbirds. Um, so these long narrow landscape features, um, you know, like these drainage ditches and these fence rows, they really make uh, excellent habitat corridors. Um, they can increase the rate at which pollinators colonize an area and they can also facilita facilitate movement of different wildlife species across properties and it helps them get to different um, patches of habitat. Like in that picture on the left, you see that that kind of planting goes right into that woodland. So it creates some safe corridors for them to, to move across the landscape. Um, and, you know, of course, as you're, as we're promoting these habitats for pollinators, you're getting other beneficial insects in as well, like our seraphid flies or a parasitic wasp and lady beetles. And some of those, as well as our insectivorous birds, which will also like these habitats, um, can help to control pests in fields. So another good reason to kind of incorporate these habitats within our agriculture. So just concluding with just a note on Lepidopteran conservation, we are familiar with the declines in our monarch butterfly. Um, and I like this quote from the Fish and Wildlife Service, no one group or agency is responsible for monarch conservation. And I think this can be very readily applied to all pollinator conservation. Um, everyone has to work to kind of improve and restore and create these habitats. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I know you guys are all doing fantastic work on that. Uh, on that. Um, so our monarchs definitely flagship species for our Lepidopterans. And we are seeing some declines in butterfly abundance. So this is research uh, done in just a few years, last year actually, what well, was published last year, it was done a few years ago in Ohio that is showing some declines in some of our butterfly species. 
Um, so the, uh, starting from the uh, right side, the upper right and going across, we have the wood nymph, we have the red spotted purple, the American copper, and then our great spangled fritillary um, again. So declines were noted in all of these species as well as some of the most common and hardy adapted species uh, like our cabbage white. And that, that right there is concerning to me. You know, we're seeing declines in some of our very hardy species that can use disturbed areas. Yeah, what is that saying for some of our other species? So we know that we're seeing declines within our pollinators. My point here is it does, it does cross all of our pollinator species. Good news is though, any efforts that we are doing out on the landscape are going to be worthwhile. Um, you know, when I talk about putting out habitat for some of our wildlife species, you know, for example, our grassland birds, often you need these large acreages of grasslands to really attract the birds and to really um, have them breed there. But the great news with our pollinators and with our lepidopterans is that you don't need these big areas. You can just have a small patch in your backyard or on your property and it can be in a really disturbed uh, urban area, for example, and it's still going to be beneficial. So I, I always like sharing that with people. Um, I don't often get to say that when I talk about managing for wildlife. Uh, so if you, if you can't, uh, you know, if you're not in a situation where you can provide habitat, there are lots of other ways to get involved. You guys are already doing that with all the great projects Denise has set up, but there are lots of citizen science projects for our lepidopterans as well. And for our birds, we talked about eBird, but I will have all of these opportunities linked on my blog uh, article. And uh, I'm gonna stop there. There are additional resources on this site as well, um, but I think maybe I left a couple minutes for questions. Uh, and so I'll stop there. And I'm going to stop, uh, you stop sharing my screen. I guess I'll leave that up for a minute there if you need to jot down my contact information. But I'll yeah, that's fine. Up. You can leave that up. Thanks, Marnie. Thanks yeah. so much. Um, yeah. Guys, uh, the, the chat box is open if you have questions that you want to put in, or if you want to type two question marks, um, we can uh, have folks unmute and ask questions directly. Marnie, there was a question earlier about um, bees and, uh, oh, sorry, yellow jackets and ants in hummingbird feeders. Yes, let me um, just, cause I think I have a slide on that somewhere. Oh, maybe I don't. Oh, there it is. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, bees and wasps. Um, so yeah, that is, that is definitely something that we run into. Um, so here are some options, taking your feeder down for a few days. Yeah, it's probably not, may not be something you necessarily want to do. Um, so the type of feeder can make a difference. Drip free feeders are recommended. Um, so, you know, not just think about, is there a feeder design that's better out there? So the, the bees and wasps can't access it. So dripping feeder, that's not going to be great. I would go back to those dish feeders um, on that picture on the lower left there. Um, they have those little bee wasp guards, which is the little yellow flower. And what that does is it just makes the distance between the nectar uh, a little bit greater. So they can't really access it, it, access it as much. Do those work? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends on how messy your hummingbirds are and if they leave nectar kind of around those ports. So my best advice, I guess, would be to use those uh, disc feeders. Don't do a drip feeder. Clean them as often as you can so that sugar water isn't uh, hanging out on the outside of that feeder. Um, and hopefully that works for you. Okay, there's a couple monarch questions. So Jane is in Greene County and has noted that she's not seeing monarchs, just a few swallowtails and a few skippers um, compared to other summers. Any comments on where we are with timing this year? I also have not seen monarchs out. Um, my milkweed is just starting to bloom. I, I'm in Delaware uh, and I don't typically see monarchs until later in the summer, uh, July, August. So um, we might still be a little bit early. Um, I haven't looked recently into monarch migrations. I probably should have done that, I apologize. Um, but there are some sites online where you can kind of see where they are. So Monarch Watch, I believe is one of them um, to kind of see you know, where they are in their migrational journeys. Um, I do know, I think, and I'm, some of you chime in if you know, that there was a little uptick in um, monarchs the past year. So hopefully we'll have a good year this year. Oh good, and Laura noted that she's in Ashland County and she just started seeing them a couple weeks ago. 
Ashlyn, okay, good. So they're they're showing up slowly but surely. Okay, I got my chat window pulled up now. Great. Uh, Marsha had a question about uh, lots of eggs being laid on her milkweed, but um, they seem to hatch and begin for a day or so, and then they're gone. Wonders what um, what might be going on there. They seem to hatch and begin to feed just for a day or two, and then they disappear. Oh yeah, um, I don't know if it's necessarily ants. I would say something is getting uh, getting those little guys. Um, you know, and that's kind of a tough tough thing. You can just let nature take its course and be thankful there's lots of eggs. That's why they lay lots of different eggs. Um, or you can maybe bring those little caterpillars inside and uh, um, help a few of them. Um, to and Marnie, I can, I can chime in on this because there was a yes, study, please do. Um, in Michigan, I'm trying to think of the entomologists who did this and uh, folks, if you, if you remember or have that link. And so they recommend cutting um, the milkweed back in early summer um, to get a reflush ah. and a later bloom so that you can avoid some of that predation because they were finding a lot of um, actually egg predation on milkweed from ants um, coming in. Um, let's see with aphids on those uh, on those milkweeds. So I'll try to find a f that that link if I can. Uh, oh yeah, it. yeah, that's great. Thanks, Denise, for later bloom time. Okay, perfect. Uh, Rich had a question about what plant species would be typical in a hedgerow. Oh, um, here I think I'm gonna. Oh well, I don't know where it is. So for a hedgerow, I really want to get to my list because I don't want to leave anything out. So bear with me here. A uh, Doug Landis is the, uh, I'm getting closer to finding that milkweed study. Okay, can you see that? So this is um, from research for, uh, on bobwhite quail, blackberry, raspberry, dogwood, sumac. These are all great options. Um, you know, obviously not gonna plant poison ivy, <laughs> but if you have a hedgerow out there and you have some of those, uh, you know, ivy and, and grape kind of coming in, even greenbrier, not things that we typically like to see, um, but they provide really nice cover and they also provide some food options for bobwhite. And as you guys know, those are um, maybe not the, the greenbrier, but the elderberry, hazelnut, dogwood, sumac, all, the, all, all those other ones are going to be good for the pollinators as well. Um, and Denise, if you have any other ones to incorporate, feel free. Yeah, in fact, Marty and I are uh, going to get back to work on a long yes. uh, <laughs> solved project. <laughs> you want to mention that real quick? Yeah, so OSU has the uh, native landscaping for wildlife fact sheet that is horribly outdated. Um, and so Denise and I are, we have it on our calendar for August and it is going to get done this time because we've, we've revisited this multiple times, but we're going to hopefully put together a very nice list for pollinators you know, and wildlife, native wildlife. So kind of a married list that's going to benefit both of them. And we will be covering, you know, uh, forbs, shrubs, trees, and vines as well in that. So, yay. And we, and we actually came up, we uh, brainstormed a really nice list for the muck crops branch a few years ago. Yes. Uh, you know, Bob Philbrun, who manages our muck crops branch in Celeryville, and he wanted to um, add some hedgerow habitat up there. And so we kind of looked at, a, a, you know, a list of kind of our favorites for wildlife and pollinators. And, uh, and so maybe we can think of, of how to making sure we kind of highlight those additions too. Right. Uh, okay, so. Uh, let's see. Yeah, good, are you, go ahead. I was gonna do the yep. same. Uh, recommendation for a drip, fountain, or water mister. They, um, I don't unfortunately have a feature, um, a water feature on my property. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a good recommendation, Kelly. Anybody else? Just kind of asking everybody. So feel free to chime in and answer Kelly there. And Roxanne brings up the point from Xerxes about not recommending to bring caterpillars in to hand rear them. Um, and so I wonder if you have any, any thoughts on that, Marnie? Oops, she's mm. thinking, I thought she froze. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm torn because the ecologist in me says we need to let nature take its course and uh, um, let them naturally um, mature. Um, but then the educator in me, <laughs> it's like a, you know, it's a really great opportunity for education. Um, 
I know I, and, and some, Denise, feel free to chime in here, but um, I, I, I guess I typically say it's okay to bring a few in, but um, for the most part, let them, let them find their own way and get the plants out there and get the resources out there that they, that they need. So I'm, um, I'm blanking on the professor's first name. It's the, um, the Guerra Lab, G-U-E-R-R-A. And I apologize, I can't remember his first name. Uh, but he's at the University of Cincinnati and um, does a lot of monarch research. And so this question came up when we were on a, a volunteer tour with him at the Cincinnati Zoo. And he felt that, um, especially if the caterpillars are being reared for educational use, that's a way that people really connect with monarchs and care right. and want to change behavior and help other people get excited. So, um, he, you know, wasn't a big fan of doing mass rearings and, you know, some people have like hundreds that they're rearing and yeah. releasing yeah. Um, and, you know, what, what, uh, what uh, behaviors or, um, you know, characteristics are we favoring by doing that? I'm kind of playing mother nature, but on the other hand, exactly. a little bit of, of that, that's kind of how I feel about um, being yeah. happy, is, you know, a little bit to get people excited um, might have some value. Right, right. I would agree with that. Oh, and Donna says she saw drip misters at uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. Oh, great. And I think, I like wild oh, birds oh how about the tropical milkweed, Marnie? That'd be a good question to kind of... Why yeah. Not? Okay. So tropical milkweed um, is, is definitely readily used. Um, it's, it's not, I, I tend to say just don't because it's not a native. Um, and oh man, it's, there's enough, there's another issue that is uh, escaping me. At, uh, there's a disease that sometimes yes. uh, overwinters in the plant, I think. Thank and, you. Yeah. Yes, there is a disease that sometimes overwinters, so that can, of course, impact our monarch populations. Um, but it's beautiful, and we had it planted at the Gwen Conservation Area, which is part of uh, the Molly Karen Ag Center. It's where Farm Science Review is. We had it planted out around the cabin for a long time, and it was always used, and it was always eaten. But um, given that, that disease, it's just not a good idea to have it out there. So um, we got rid of it. We, re we replaced it with um, a, few other, a few other things. Um, so yeah, typically avoid it, um, even though it's beautiful. And then, yep, Denise just put a link on for tropical milkweed, if you want to look into that a little bit more. Awesome. Well, Marnie, thank you so much. This has been a really great session. Yeah. I know I took lots of notes and some oh, cool good. things I want to add into my own landscape. So um, guys, uh, 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 thank you to Marnie or appreciation, a reaction with a hands up or a clap would be great. And uh, mm -hmm. Marnie, always uh, appreciate your knowledge and your willingness to, to help out and teach others. Oh, sure. Thank you all. And uh, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. And um, well, have a great day.